This Short Code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Code podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews by students for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcode.com. Welcome back to the Short Code Podcast, the show that gives you an honest look at medical school and which is also a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler with me today in the SCP studio, a bountiful crop of medical students. Say hello to the drought-tolerant M2, Maddie Fitzhugh. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it threw me off when you said M2 for a second. Uh, but well, I, guess I mean, I think it's time we celebrate <laughs> yeah, your M2. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> we're also joined by the evergreen M2, Chirayu Shukla. Hello. We have the lovely perennial MD student, Aline Sanduk. Oh, Thank you. And she's hardy in zone five. It's MD, PhD student, Hannah Van Ert. Hi. I don't know if being hardy is the most. I think I got the short end of that stick. Thank you. Hi, Dave. Somebody always does. <laughs> hardy in zone five. I, that's, that's what is like, zone five? That's the, the whatever, the USDA uh, zones for plants. Got it. Got it. It's oh. the whole crops metaphor. Got you know. it. I'm going to take that as I'm resilient. You're resilient. Thank you. Mm. Yes. It's a compliment. Don't four? Forget it. You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Shirayu, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. So, yeah, I'm Shirayu. I'm from all over. So, I was born in India, and then I moved to Utah when I was four. Then I moved to Maine when I was eight, and then I've been in Iowa since I was 12. I went to college at Iowa State, majored in biology and psychology, and my biggest reason for getting into medical school is I still have a lot of family in India and they live in like poor rural like village areas. So I saw the disparity between healthcare here and healthcare there. And that's kind of what got me into medicine and got me more interested. And the more I started going into the field, the more I liked, oh, this is one of the only fields I don't find. I like the aspect of learning something new every day and I like dealing with people. So did you consider other fields? I mean, you know, I looked at engineering. I looked at I wanted to there was a short period of time where I wanted to be in something like sports related but then i'm not athletic enough uh, so here you i am to. you are wearing a white polo so you're halfway there <laughs> <laughs> and joggers yeah. and joggers yeah. try are your parents academics no so my parents my mom is a homemaker she and my dad uh my dad went to college but in india it's only three years there mm-hmm. so it was uh, he kind of worked his way up to the point where he's at, but he, he works in IT and I saw his job and I was like, okay, that's not where I'm going. Same. <laughs> Have you tried turning it off and back on? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work most of the time. <laughs> so here's what I wanted to talk about this week. Medicine is not a static profession. Not only are there always new things to learn, but the profession, the culture and the people change too. Sometimes change happens because accreditation bodies force that change. Like the last time they insisted that schools combine clinical experiences and scientific content so they weren't as siloed as they were before. Sometimes things change when a new generation of students enter the profession and insists that the old ways no longer or never did serve students. So I'm wondering, my question to you is, what kinds of things do you think about that you would like to change in medicine or medical education? Mm. A lot, I think. I just read an op-ed actually or an editorial that was written by like kind of a famous psychiatrist in Iowa. He retired and he actually works at the VA now. His name's uh, Don Black. And oh, um, sure, yeah. Do you know Don Black? Yeah, I met him, yeah. I'm a big fan. He's really cool. He's written a lot of books. I think like his big claim to fame is studying different personality disorders and like specifically antisocial and narcissistic personality disorders. But anyway, he wrote an editorial a couple of years ago about how there's just not enough humanities and literature and art and medicine. And I mean, pretty, well, that's why I love him. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, he is validating everything that yeah. you guys do mm-hmm. here specifically. 
but like he made a pretty bold claim of it's all trash like you should just <laughs> burn it down and start again and <laughs> you know because he references i mean not quite that dramatic but he does reference like the flexner report and that's uh-huh. why medical education mm-hmm. so science heavy is because of this infamous report that was written a million years ago do you know that hardin library they have our results from that report there's a little pamphlet oh. in Hardin, and we did not do great <laughs> back in 18, whatever it was. Interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. we've been around a lot. Like, I mm-hmm. was been around a long time. So if, it, so if you don't know what the Flexner Report is, it is the incredibly influential report by an education specialist in the early 20th century. And he wasn't a physician. He you know, wasn't a scientist. He was just a, an education guy. But he was tasked by this sort of shady cabal of medical schools, prominent medical schools, to fix medicine and medical education. And so he went to all these schools and he studied them. And his report was basically like, these guys are all idiots. They're not focused on science. They're all focused on pseudoscience. And what we should do is completely reform medical education such that science is the only thing that is studied in medical school. And within a very short amount of time, like a whole shitload of medical schools Mm -hmm. basically closed Mm -hmm. as a direct result of this report, which you could argue kind of makes sense. I mean, you know, you need science to actually know medicine. But unfortunately, what it did was it completely stripped away any other disciplines that might be helpful to physicians. And so that's why in this day and age, up until I would say like the beginning of the 21st century there was so much science and so little humanities and so little of other disciplines that again could help the profession so that's the flexner report yeah stay tuned for the black report (laughs) about how there should be more humanities right i mean well and also the other i mean you said black and it just reminded me that one of the other things it did was it pretty much completely eliminated medical education for students of color or women or, or anybody or women, that was poor, or, or, right. or basically really? anyone that wasn't a white rich man that came from a privileged family. Yeah. Really? Yeah, totally. Because you had a lot of what it also did is it increased the education requirements. So that was kind of the foundation of you need to have a bachelor's degree or it was some sort of like mm. equivalent education. Like you couldn't have just come in straight from medical school because one of the other problems is there would be these like smaller quote unquote medical schools that would train a bunch of hoax scientists i mean they were to be fair they were also like still teaching bloodletting on I mean, all medical education bullshit. was not great yeah. in the early 20th century that's what's important to remember about but that. then what it ended up doing then was having this prior education requirement so not only did you have to go to like high school and you had to have some form of basic science training as well in order to get into medical school so that was like one of the also foundations of we're gonna kick women or you know, just anybody that wasn't a rich white man who couldn't who afford to go to school it, for medical the barrier, school. Right? For sure. yeah. yeah. We were at the writing university. We were here at the University of Iowa. They build themselves as the writing university. Iowa Writers Workshop is based here. And just about every college has a writing program. And so we were among the first here at Iowa to have a writing program, which evolved into the writing and humanities program. And uh, yeah, lots of other schools have sort of started doing these things now too which is great yeah well i mean i've you know my first year here i kind of noticed that it's so easy to get bogged down by all the science and you know we have medicine and science society and we have caps but those things are just pass fail Mm -hmm. and so it's so easy to just not put any importance on it when Mm -hmm. you're spending a week studying science and you know it's tough like it got so bad that one time i had a dream about ion channels (laughs) (laughs) I just, one night I just I was dreaming about ions going through a channel and okay, it's hard. which ones? <laughs> I think potassium. Yes. For it. Sorry, I did but. cardiac arrhythmia research and yeah. potassium channels are my fave. Yeah. You are the biggest nerd on earth, Hannah. It's amazing. When you get asked your year interview, what's your favorite ion channel? You'll have a ready. Oh, uh, yep, I have it. It's the one that keeps your heart from going. But I mean, they all kind of do. But <laughs> <laughs> it's my fave. <laughs> Sorry, keep going. Yeah, no, but you know, it's so hard to stay focused on the being a human part Mm -hmm. of things you know like we'll have lectures about intro to the healthcare system or like how to talk to patients but then we're really not tested over that Mm -mm. you know like Mm -mm. the only question we've ever had about like intro to the healthcare system is 
when was Medicare passed? You know, and the options were like 61, 62, 64, 65. <laughs> so Bastards. It's like, yeah, it was yeah. like you're asking us trivia instead of asking us about the things that really matter. Yeah. You know? uh-huh. And you yeah. see that. And it's like when you go to a doctor, right, you're not, you assume that we have the knowledge or like yeah. they have the knowledge. What differentiates like a good doctor and a not a good one is how good you are at dealing with patients. And the ones yeah. that are more empathetic and can actually deal with patients are hands down. I'd rather go to them. Even if they don't know what they're talking about, as long as they're nice to me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I prefer them. You know, I prefer them. To, but, you, you know, like, I'm not, yeah. as a layman, I'm not going to know uh, for the difference between, like, minor things. So right. the message, so the message here is, if you're not sure if you're going to be a good doctor, uh, uh, scientifically, Focus, you know, like just forget all that and learn how to be a human. Yeah. Fake patients you, will love you. Yeah, fake I, till you make it. And I you think can't, it's well, like, that's not. Uh, <laughs> I think it's more at least how I've always viewed it because I don't have a great memory. Do I at least know where I could look to find it? And to mm-hmm. me, and I think a lot of education specialists would agree that l- learning how to learn or learning where to find things is maybe more important than having just this like book of knowledge in your brain because let's face it that yeah. book of knowledge is going to be out of date real quick uh, it's always yeah. changing so, yeah you know, especially as immunologists you learn something now yeah. you're not gonna like it'll be irrelevant in a couple yeah. of years anyway and, yeah i just know from like personal experiences like within my family and also just if you just look at like basic humanity that treating people like people goes a long way mm, exactly. and it keeps people coming back and it helps you build relationships with people and i think everyone would prefer to work with a competent, nice person than an abrasive genius. Mm. I think hands down. I've never heard anyone be like, yeah, I'd love to be treated like shit every day <laughs> to get someone who got 100% on their test instead of 90%. Yeah. Totally. As long as they're smart, who cares? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you've gone through medical school and if you've passed, then you know what, yeah. like you have the knowledge, like everyone has the knowledge is how you treat people. That The process is yeah. tight. It yeah. doesn't let people progress who shouldn't exactly right Mm -hmm. everyone who's here belongs here and if you're (laughs) i know like it's really hard to push away the imposter syndrome but the fact is it would be dangerous to let people practice medicine who didn't have any business and some Mm -hmm. people do slip through but we're not them there's some like true i don't know imposters but not us i mean there's a lot of effort you have to put in just to get here it's hard as it's hard to be here. It's even harder to pass when you are here. Yeah, if yeah. you're passing, you did something right. You deserve to be. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What else would we like to change about medical education? So in mass, our medicine and society class, my group did a project about improving LGBTQ mm-hmm. plus health literacy. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we found out we did a bunch of research because like you have to for the project and stuff. And it takes 36 hours of education to be considered competent in caring for like that patient population. And the average medical school time is like, I can't remember exactly. So don't quote me on this, but I think it's like four or five hours oh, yeah. out of 36. And yeah. so we like made this whole project on like proposing how to change the curriculum at Carver specifically to, you know, improve that number. But I it's totally very it. specialized knowledge. There's a reason yeah. that... Like there are people who yeah, specialize in that. Is it? Well, so one thing I looked up for my class is that. This class. For my class, my the, sexual violence The class, class that you taught, the sexual violence, <laughs> or that you. That I course directed and coordinated as a roadie for the actual talent. That was a lot of work for sure, but it was really fun. But one topic we thought about including was, you know, LGBTQ care, especially for uh, LGBTQ victims of sexual mm-hmm. violence, right? And something I read, which I thought was really interesting, is that uh, trans men, if they haven't undergone, you know, reconstructive surgery, like they still need cervical cancer mm-hmm. screening. If they still have a cervix, they need that screening because they can still get cancer. But like specifically related to the forensic exam, trans men who've been on testosterone for a long time, testosterone causes vaginal atrophy. Mm-hmm. So you have to use a pediatric speculum. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's way too painful to do a forensic exam oh, or a okay. pelvic exam. So it's yeah. like the, the devil is in the details here. They're a unique population, just like anyone else. Yeah. And there are tips and tricks on how to serve them better. Yeah. And there's a lot of things that could be included in medicine that isn't. And there's never enough time which stinks, but yeah. it sounds beneficial for people to hear about that. Yeah, the mass course director actually came and listened to our presentation and was like, hey, could you email me your poster? So that was pretty exciting because I feel like a lot of the things feel so so much like busy work in mass, mm-hmm. our class. And so 
Mm-hmm. It felt rewarding to actually like maybe see something come of it. There's so many problems in general in medical education, but one of the things I think that our faculty and staff do pretty well here is listening to Mm -hmm. ideas from the students. They may not always take them up, but they do seek them out. They do seek the ideas out and the thoughts out. There is truly an open door policy here. I think it's great. I think think you said it perfectly. They can't, they're not always in a position to implement what they're hearing, but they are curious and they will create space for people to share those ideas. And that, by the way, just a compliment of the highest order when someone emails you to be like, hey, can you send me the thing you worked really hard on? Because I want to keep it forever. That's awesome. <laughs> and you're like, yes, yes, I will. You're like, <laughs> sure. It was and I'll brag about it on a podcast. <laughs> you, should be able to, yeah. you should be able to put that in your CV, you know, like yeah. as a publication. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a white paper it's a white paper, or a gray paper whatever they call it yeah. yeah i published it to somebody to this one particular person's brain <laughs> the one email inbox. what else would we change so this goes more towards like actually just the practice of medicine so without getting into a huge long story my mom had some pretty severe like chronic illness issues this past it's getting better in the last six months but good last like year and a half was really bad and it was one of those things where We think it was like some sort of autoimmune disease. So she went to see all these specialists. And basically what she ran into a lot was a no one willing to like actually sit down and address her problems. So one of the things she was experiencing was dysphagia. So not only did she go to an ENT, a GI, and there was I think there was also a neurologist. No one addressed her dysphagia. And it got to the point where she lost like 30 pounds because she wasn't able to eat solid food. Dysphagia Mm -hmm. is when you can't trouble swallowing. Yeah. Yeah. No one touched it. She lost like it was you could watch in her medical record. It slowly go. I mean, it was going down and it went down pretty rapidly. And you don't have to be an M a new incoming M1 would say, oh, a rapid loss of 30 pounds. Probably not great. And so no one touched it. A lot of people were just like, were they avoiding it? Do you think or were they or is it just well, I'm focusing on my particular area right now. But like an ENT that's literally in their name, your mm. nose and throat. Yeah. <laughs> a neurologist, a f- functional motility person. And the GI, that's also in their title. It was just so wild to me. And then she, there was just multiple experiences that she had. But what the point I'm trying to say is a holistic care. So even if you are a GI person, it is still on you to pay attention to the whole person. Because ultimately, your organ system, like I want to be an OB, still ultimately it is on me to pay attention to the whole person. Because Mm -hmm. even though... I know a lot about the uterus and the ovaries and the vagina or whatever. It's still on me to you're it's part of the whole person and it's on me to take responsibility for that. And if I can't directly help them, if I don't know jack shit about the GI tract or about, I mean, I know a little bit about the liver, but that's beside the point. It's on you to refer them to that person. And then also like maybe as much as possible, I know it gets really hard and really busy but keep on top of that person, like check in, making sure they're okay. And so what I'm like, the holistic approach, and then also just like treating people like a human. Like, I think we get, my mom felt really heartbroken a little bit that, you know, she was only seen as, you know, a tonsil biopsy or whatever. And so I think as much as possible, and it doesn't like the other thing that I'm saying, it's, I don't think it's that hard because one of the things that no one ever said to her was I am so sorry I don't know but I want to help you find out who can Mm -hmm. no one said that to her I think one person the neurologist I have a family friend whose dad is a neurologist and he was the one she saw but he was the only one that was like I don't know we're gonna write you all these referrals we'll check back we'll find we'll figure this out but no none of her other specialists said that Mm. so i think it's Mm. just like humanity and just like connecting to people and it was a scary thing for her to go through like she's not eating she felt like crap and so even yeah you're gonna feel helpless like you as a person and i don't want to do that i don't want to say i don't know but at the end of the day it's like can you just say i don't know i'm so sorry let me get you a nutrition consult so that you're getting some nutrients let me get you you know let me order these things for you and I want to see you come back. Hardly no one said that to her except for the neurologist. And I was like, that was like some of the easiest shit to say. I want to see you back and I want to get to the bottom The one of that takes the least technical training. Yes, to be like, exactly. I'm sorry this is happening to you. Yeah. 
and not blaming it on anxiety because she went to the ER once and the doctor literally said, yo, you're this, this looks like anxiety. And my mom was like, I literally almost got up the gurney and choked. Him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So I think I'll show you dysphagia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. but she was like, she had lost like 40 pounds by that point. So she was just like, anyway, Damn, but that's a lot. My mom dude. ultimately lost like 50 pounds. She that's looked, a whole other person. Yeah. That's she, a small dog. And that's the skinniest I've ever seen her. And so she's wow. luckily getting better. But autoimmune disorders are weird. Well, and she got it Scary. after her Shingrix vaccine. And so I'm not, I'm oh, a shit. very pro I need to vax get my person. Shingrix vaccine. <laughs> very pro vax. But what I think happened is my family, we have a little bit of underlying autoimmune stuff anyway. And so our theory is that maybe that was just enough of an immunological trigger. Mm. that it and she had chicken pox as a kid so it's entirely possible that maybe her body attacked viral antigen i don't know mm. but moral of the story she's doing much better and the what i want to change about medicine is really do try to keep a holistic picture like even if it's just two minutes at the end of your visit and just ask how's everything else are you able to walk are you able to get around how's your pain like just simple things and then again yeah try not to be afraid to say i don't know but I really want to help you out yeah. because I think you don't have going back to you don't have to know everything. But if you just show someone that you care and it also helps them keep comes what another thing she just kind of gave up on the healthcare system. She was just like, I'm not going to go back there. And she's, she's a healthcare me. worker. My mom. Yeah, she was. She worked in healthcare. She's an, an x-ray or like a radiology technician or technologist. I think they're called now. And so she did that for 15 years and now she does like more billing and coding but she's still in the health she knows how to navigate the healthcare system yeah I mean, there's so. just so much distrust because of that yeah know? totally that, yeah. that's what it comes down to and you don't mm -hmm. want you don't ever want that to form yeah know? i feel like something i hear people in the clinic here say a lot which i think is like a very nice way to communicate this hey i'm not sure what's going on without i don't know like prostrating yourself on the ground which is probably how some doctors mm -hmm. feel when they have to say i don't know because probably they said that in med school and they got pimped and someone shamed them they're like i'm never saying i don't know again <laughs> but something i hear people say a lot is i'm stumped like you're a very mm -hmm. interesting person this is a very mm -hmm. interesting case i'm gonna call some people and see what i can find out but the other thing I hear people say is you're not following the rules. Like you, you didn't read the textbook. You know? Oh, I That's thought like they were joke. like patient shaming. I'm like, no, tell me who these people are. <laughs> sorry. I, I should have said that I'm better, but just I was at a like an M and M, I think, and someone a morbidity and mortality conference. Mm -hmm. People discuss their medical mistakes, and someone was talking about a tumor that they resected, and she said this didn't follow the rules. It did, this cancer didn't read the textbook, and I was like, oh, what a funny way mm -hmm. to say that. Like, I know how this should have gone. This was just very unusual. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah, I'm sorry that happened to well, your mom. Well, I'm glad she's feeling one totally off the, it's kind of on topic. We do have them, but there's things called like navigators that basically, because you're seeing so many specialists that it can be very overwhelming or just like frustrating. Like at one point they weren't sending like test results to another doctor or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she was, and she's sick. It's hard for her to manage all of this. And like I said, she's illiterate in the healthcare system. Can you imagine if you didn't speak English or if you had no idea about the healthcare system or know about referrals or anything? You were just like a normal person. If you were a normal yeah. person, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think that would be a better idea, and I know the VA does it somewhat, and I think we have kind of at this larger academic medical centers, is hiring these people to manage and basically saying, oh, hey, I say doctor wrote you an order to see you back in six weeks. Let me schedule that for you. A social worker. Yes, essentially a social worker. Yeah, just someone who helps you manage, especially when you're chronically ill like that. I think that would be a huge, I think that would maybe go a long way to like getting the people to the doctor or the provider. Because that's honestly, that's more than half the battle. I think she just got really fed up with it. But she's doing better. She's still not 100%, but she's doing a lot better. She's gaining weight. So, yeah. <laughs> Listeners, if you ask us a question, it means that I don't have to make something up to talk about on the show. And the show becomes what you want it to be. So send your questions to theshortcoats at gmail.com or leave a message at 347-SHORT-CT. We'll talk about it on the show. A recent study in JAMA Pediatrics builds on others that have found a link between burnout and depression and mistreatment in medical school. This one has found a link between mistreatment and medical school attrition, and it may offer an explanation for why the number of non-white students have been... Mm -hmm declining in recent years. 20,000 students who started school in 2014 and 2015 were asked about their experiences of mistreatment and discrimination by faculty, staff, and other students. The surveys asked about instances of public humiliation, 
physical harm and threats of harm, denied opportunities, receiving lower grades and evals than their peers and offensive remarks about race, ethnicity or gender. Those who reported no mistreatment left medical school at a rate of about 1.2%. Those who said they'd experienced recurring mistreatment left at a rate of 4.1%. There were higher attrition rates for with mistreatment for all sexes, races, ethnicities, except for Asian students. Students who were underrepresented in medicine and who experienced mistreatment had the highest attrition rates. Kind of not surprising at all, but also these are the kinds of things that I think you need to continually look at. And, and do the math. And like... M- Right. Like we can all say we have the impression, but to do it rigorously and to have an accepted peer reviewed study on it. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, but also schools need to continuously gather this this information as best they can to sort of understand what's happening in this space. We in medical education get all bent out of shape and people have to leave. People decide to drop out or whatever. Oh, why are why is this happening? And it might it's probably tempting to go, well, that's that their that individual person's mm. experience or maybe there was a fault with that person maybe they didn't study hard enough maybe they didn't maybe they had problems elsewhere and it just interfered with their medical education but that's the easy those are the easy explanations the harder explanation is it's our fault mm. when these things happen so. Yeah, I don't know what the process of what I'm kind of thinking of is I know we have the promotions committee. So if you flunk a class or if you get in trouble, you have to go before the promotions committee. And I was thinking about maybe using that as like a can we keep an eye on at risk people or like how can we use that as a way of inter- intervening and maybe preventing that? And then also what Aline was saying, keeping track of who exactly because, yeah, it is easy to be like, oh, well, that student left. And we, you know, I don't think we have that many kids at our school leave per year Mm. but you know not just saying oh this is a one-off because it's maybe it's probably not maybe it's not and maybe i don't know much about the promotions committee but i wonder if it would be a nice opportunity for some trusted faculty members or people that are on the committee to sit and be like really what was the issue was it studying yeah Yeah. will you please tell us if anyone said anything to you can you please just and i don't know because that also does require a large degree of trust right if i feel slighted by the medical school i don't know how open i'm gonna be i don't know how well that would work sometimes when you've been screwed over pretty Mm -hmm. hard by a system it's like cutting out a cancer like you go beyond the margins even people who might be good you're like i can't take the risk i'm too vulnerable i wonder if you could say hey you bring an advocate with you to this meeting. You bring someone that you feel trusted. Like maybe it's they actually another. allow that. They do. Okay. For promotions. Yeah. Cause I mm. wonder if that would also, if I was in trouble, I have a couple of faculty that I feel comfortable going to, or even some like older students and saying like, Hey, I can't, I don't know how to talk about this, but you know, my story, will you come with me? Well, there's, mm-hmm. and you know, so that's promotions. Mm-hmm. And I agree. That's a great place to, to ask questions mm-hmm. like this, but there are other people who, you know, they don't get in trouble. Mm. They don't fail a course. They don't They don't have outward problems, but they have experienced multiple uh, things in this area where they're ba- basically they're like, well, I don't belong here. Mm-hmm. That's the message that they get. And so they end up, or it causes them enough distress that they're not achieving the things that they want to achieve. And so they just decide to drop out. I think the other problem for, and you know, like every school wants to be more diverse we do live in Iowa. And so it's really hard. It's probably harder for us to gather numbers that would be statistically significant in that. We're region. not a big state to begin with. All right. of Iowa is 3,000 people. Yeah. That's less people than live in Washington, D.C. How many people? Three million. Oh, oh live 3, in D.C.? Oh, did I say 3,000? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I meant 3,000 pigs per person. But, <laughs> uh, I, I was like, 3,000 people in Iowa? Sorry. Wow. <laughs> 3 million, sorry. I'm literally looking up pigs per person. Yeah, I know it's like there's 3 to 1. The ratio yeah, I have seen that. Astounding. Yeah. 3 to 5 to 1. Mm-hmm. So we better hope they don't learn how to vote. <laughs> <That's what laughs> I mean, maybe they will, maybe it will be in our way. You know what? We tend to have more vegans and vegetarians. (laughs) (laughs) They'll remember. It's like the eat more chicken commercial. No, yeah, that's right. So So, yeah, kind of on that topic of diversity, I'm in my PhD training right now, and the MSTV actually runs like a other. 
it's called the summer program but basically what happens is undergrad students that go to smaller like liberal arts schools or just smaller colleges will spend summers at larger academic institutions to get research experience over the summers and so the mstp runs the summer program sumr and then there's also i think like the graduate college runs something called ru students Mm. uh, or ru program and so basically i was talking to this undergrad student who's from maryland and then florida and she was asking me about the diversity here and i i'm white and i was like well the only thing that i've maybe have a quote-unquote disadvantage is i'm female or I'm a woman and I'm like I can't really speak to that I've heard you know there's a couple stories on campus that I have heard and she's well is the is your graduate program like is the graduate program in immunology like how how do you see diversity there she's I've heard it's better over in the college of medicine and I was like I just don't know Mm -hmm. I don't know I know a couple of the stories that I've heard but day to day I'm not sure and so I tried to hook her up with some other women of color who are in our program but that's something that, yeah, I just don't know enough about. What you're saying is, hey, thanks to this person for doing the study, because apparently we need more studies like this. Yeah. Well, and so we were talking about, well, it's Iowa. Like it's oh. just that baseline. Man. It's not hugely diverse. And then I think that is a feedback loop. I think we don't get many diverse applicants. We don't get many diverse faculty because... And I've heard of some really awful things that people have, like instances of racism that people have, even at the grocery store. Like there was an older MD student who she was walking out of the grocery store at High V, which is like out where I live and is like not where you would expect it. And someone screamed at her, go back to where you came from. And so I think it's just a huge feedback loop, too. Like I, mm. it's really hard and it's something that we need to work on in terms of increasing diversity, but all like increasing diversity for the benefit of students but also for the benefit of our community and education you know one limitation of this study is that you know the authors probably weren't able to collect data from people who had already left Mm. i didn't read i don't remember like at what points they delivered this or there were multiple points Mm. that they delivered this these surveys but it's possible the people who left didn't fill out the second survey or whatever and so they weren't captured by the data as having left. Yeah. You know what they So there's do. more. There's probably the attrition rate is actually probably, probably higher. higher. Yeah. I think the best people to be in charge of this should be the ombuds. Mm. Cuz I don't think they even keep records which like, you know, I don't think they do. Yeah. So you'd have to create some kind of HIPAA system to like be able to create cuz what I what, what we're talking about really is like an exit interview. You now when you quit a job good places to work usually will like i think they do that and when a student leaves yeah it's, the university, it's, students don't just ghost med <laughs> school you know like i don't think that's how that works oh, generally speaking I th- so i think there is some sort of exit interview what happens during that exit interview i'm not aware of mm-hmm. i i also know that you know we have this mistreatment policy obviously mm-hmm. probably most schools do we have a, a easy way to i think an easy way to report mistreatment i mean it's in every it's in every icon course webpage. It's in every icon clerkship webpage. Um, I will the, say it's part I, of the student handbook. It's part of the educator's handbook that we have. Yeah. And so there are ways to report this mistreatment. I'm certain that anonymity would be an issue for somebody reporting mistreatment, mm-hmm. at least for some people reporting mistreatment. So it'd probably be hard to link, you know, a report of mistreatment to a departure. I will say I've, I feel asked at multiple intervals if I'm being made to feel unwelcome or if anyone's making any remarks that are making me uncomfortable. So it's not to say that it's not happening, but I do feel like that has been a problem in the past. And I think it's probably not perfect, but I do feel like CECOM does create a lot of resources like these anonymous reporting forums. And I think clerkship directors have been made aware that hey you should at least meet the students on the first day and just let them know who you are and let them know where your office is so that if they have a problem they know how to come to you and i know for one of my recent two weekers for the mid clerkship meeting you like fill out this form to be like oh here's why i'm not doing a good job here's what i want to work on whatever i didn't fill it out and i felt a little nervous because we had a meeting with the clerkship director and uh, i was like i'm so sorry i didn't do this he was like can i tell you the truth the whole point of this is just to create an opportunity for you to let me know if you're having like 
like interpersonal issues. Like you're mm-hmm. working hard. I see you guys. You're on the wards. That's fine. I just want you. I just want to know if anyone's being mean to you. And I was like, another opportunity yeah. to let people know that things aren't going the yeah. way they should be. Yeah. And preclinical, like we have to fill out evaluations mm-hmm. for every single lecture, basically. And there's always at the bottom, like a little box to check for mistreatment. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's that's... in a lot of places, which is nice. Shortcoats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Thank you. Look, you medical students, AI is coming to take our jobs. All of our jobs. It's coming. And once that happens, I'm sure we'll have a universal basic income. I would love a vacation. And all will be well. (laughs) Great. But in the meantime, there are lots of silly things that you can do with AI. For an example, an AI called Dolly Mini is hot right now. Dolly Mini takes a text description of an image that you would like to see and creates several images based on that description. I had a way too much fun with this yesterday and today. And if you want to play along, you can visit our Instagram or watch this segment on YouTube tomorrow (laughs) when it comes out. My question for you, dear co-host, is if I show you the images... I suggested to Dolly Mini, can you identify the text prompt? Let's take a look at the first image. Don't look at the text box at the top. Oh, I can't oh. even see. Oh, I can't read it. Yeah, don't look at that. I meant to. I meant to crop it. So okay, what's nice. in the top? Le- the very top left. It looks like medical student eating apple off of a fork. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't know what else. Some of the other uh, apples look like hearts. Yeah, yeah, some of the hearts like yep, that's it. I read it like instantly, so I, uh, don't say it. I'm just gonna recuse try, myself. Try don't spoil from this. the game. <laughs> <laughs> I'll not. <laughs> Any guesses? What was the text prompt? What did I? What did I ask Dolly <laughs> Mini? What rituals do med students engage in for good grades? <laughs> <laughs> if I eat the heart of a good med student, I'll become a good med student. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, where'd the heart for the heart transplant go? Not Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I don't know. I'm stumped. This is, uh, mine are all too literal. Which kind are in med school? Yeah. Uh, I feel like Aline was very close. Well, because I eat hearts. So, okay. Oh, you know. hold on. Wait. I have an issue with this now. It's medical student eating human heart. These are all men. Interesting. Mm, and, this is, yeah, yeah, and this is the problem that you run into with these kinds of things that they're focused on. I mean, the training, the what you get out of it is entirely dependent on what you what it was get into. It. Now, yeah, I should yeah. say the Dolly Mini is a miniature version of Dolly, which has a an abbreviated training set. As I understand oh, okay. it, in order to make it usable on on the web, this these. So like, each, why was there default men though? Well, each of these images took about two minutes to generate. I'm assuming they would take a lot more. But I'm but saying I, when I you're agree. training it, why is your default men? Well, I don't know. You know, there's a really. It also depends. I mean, all of this, all of these images, I as I understand it, were gathered from the internet. I was going to say, sure, if you like go stock images, look up doctors, like oh, the, that's, that's would, true. If you look at just doctor stock image, it'd be yeah, yeah. Like Let's yeah. call out this patriarchy right here, right well, now. <laughs> so, this is a thing, apparently, like an issue people have a lot with AI is that a lot of AI algorithms, like once they're let free, they become racist very quickly. Yeah, racist and evil. <laughs> yeah. And it's because they're drawing their knowledge from our collective knowledge. So like our stereotypes become their stereotypes. And right. What we put on know. the Internet and always great. Yeah, it's like a toilet bowl yeah. that everyone shits into. I think that was the most perfect analogy <laughs> yeah, I've, that was great. I've heard. I'm not doing a good job. Today. All right, let's look at the next one. While how's your Google search? So well, Hannah, I'll try to not fix this. Yeah. So basically, you do see some women, but it's like the first doctor is actually an African American male in a coat. The next one is a so basically it's all men one two three four five six seven and then the next two are women and then you have to go eight nine ten eleven so basically that's there's a representation there but it's but your Google is trained on you oh so shit. Oh, true. wait let's go to income well, look how woke just... you are the very first one was a black doctor good for you <laughs> <laughs> good for you Hannah <laughs> okay you have to cut that. You have to cut that. <laughs> no no okay so we're incognito mode what do you got. <laughs> 
I kind of don't want to say now because I, <laughs> <laughs> I have an old white man as the first, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, the first no. image. Literally, just it's old white dude. Oh no! Okay, there's this one that keeps coming up for me, even in incognito mode. It's a woman as in a doc in a physician's coat with a gun to her head, oh. which I think says a lot about the state of oh, medicine boy. today. Okay. Yeah, so, but yeah, the first one, two, three, four, five, six are men. I don't know. I still get some females on here. Okay. Even in incognito mm. mode. You can't fool Google, Anna. Let's try the next <laughs> one. Joe. I feel like oh, it's babies. <sighs> and then a rat it, child hybrid in the middle. Is it, <laughs> is it baby as a doctor? Baby yeah. playing with stethoscope. Baby doctor. Yeah, a baby doctor. Mm. That was the. Oh. That Look at was that. The Nailed it. Wow. Killing it. One for one. Yeah, you're doing great so far. Let's try the next one. <laughs> These are terrifying. Oops. Oh, a baby doctor. This one you might have to get a little closer. Feel free to get up and uh, here it looks like cornbread or yeah, corn muffins. Looks like lemons to me actually. Some of them. Uh, Is it just I rolls bread. like gonna... bread? Dinner rolls on a pan? Yeah, that's maybe. So, maybe this wasn't as successful this is a baker offering a tray of brain muffins mm. <laughs> well, brains. I wonder if I thought you meant bran muffins I mean <laughs> <laughs> out of corrected because yeah. like, none of those look like brains yeah no I would not you get real close there. you can see right you can oh, see uh, oh, some gyri, uh, gyri mm-hmm. but yeah did I say that right yeah. gyri or salsi or the, it's okay. pronounced hili <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been so long since I've taken anything medical related okay let's try the next one don't look. Kidney. Kidney. Kidney clip what art. Kidney. Definitely some kidneys there. Kidney knife. Kidney biopsy. Is I'll give you a hint. There is an action. There are things. There is an action. There's here. a lot of knives. Or yeah, I like biopsy. Kidney surgery or kidney doing. Kidney removal. Kidney. And, and Kidney replacement. Uh, I think you're not going fancifully enough, maybe. The kidneys revolt. Well, it's not the kidney. Kidneys action. dancing. Is it fighting something? Oh. Kidney's jousting. Is it? Is it? Mm. <laughs> it looks like it's fighting. Yeah. Yeah. The you got it right. Human kidney fighting a urologist <laughs> with a sword. Wow, that was okay, great, Shrio. To be fair, the kidney okay, there's one kidney that's holding a sword, but yeah, everything else say. is a doctor doing the mm-hmm. thing to the kidney. The funny thing is, I think this yeah. one is just a kidney and then a hand holding a sword. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Not even like the kidney's holding it. <laughs> nice. All right, let's try the next one. Is that a liver? What is that? Okay. Shirayu, what is that? Uh, is it a lung? I have organ hats. Mm. Doctors wearing organs for hats. <laughs> the latest fashions. <laughs> <laughs> so organ surgical scrub caps. I don't think oh. I don't think that's oh. I don't think that's an that looks like some type of meat. Uh-huh. Well, hence liver. Is yeah, it that just, looks like someone wearing their teeth? <laughs> is it someone <laughs> wearing some type scary. of meat as like a, I don't know. It looks like a hat. Isn't yeah, it? I'll give it to you. Uh, it's a, a nurse wearing a steak hat. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, you know, only this. Also, one's these probably. are all uh, women. I know. I was just about to say that. Yeah, they're all women. I mean, Dang. don't men wear steak hats? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't there? Mer- this AI needs to check its personal biases. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's try the next one. This is oh medical students podcasting. Uh huh. Except there's a little twist in there that I don't think Dolly did well, and that is a podcast host prescribing some drugs to a medical student. Oh no, no. Oh, you would never. There's do nothing that. in there, but yeah, medical student. Well, I'll give it to you. Is that like a little Ziploc bag? In <laughs> drugs. <laughs> Here, have some drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that to medical students. <laughs> I was prescribing. We it was, will. It was, this is from a universe where this is allowed for me to prescribe People drugs. People will take you up on it. All right. <laughs> Just because you use the right word doesn't make it okay. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Let's try this one. Oh. Money. Eating hungry. Money. Oh. Mm. A money sink? A money pit? I mean, that one guy in the right is right hand corner is wearing a money gown hmm. looks like bottom right looks like she's eating the money <laughs> money grubbers money i think money hungry is the best yeah. guess so far yeah the, i mean you've got the money part but that's <laughs> <laughs> the dollar bills kind of give that away though. look at the people in the picture money is sick health care is expensive uh, okay and oh. corrupt in this country okay. yeah. i would say that is about right uh, a very sick person pays 
a hospital a million dollars. Uh, What's up with that woman eating all the money? Then? I don't, I <laughs> maybe she's, she's, maybe I she's no vomiting food. it. I think she's puking. Yeah. It. No, no. <laughs> Everyone's. <we> right. <laughs> all I think of is never mind. I'll tell you off. <laughs> this made me feel racist. That's I what I was about to say. I was like, I feel like I'm at this is like a Trump rally or like a Proud Boy <laughs> poster. <laughs> Man, poor poor white just, guys. They just it, can't get a break these days. Jeez. So we're, what we're looking at here is a grid of white men, With older, mustaches, mustaches like and beards. Anyone's all dead. All wearing blue for some reason. And they're they look very happy. happy and, yeah. and in two of them. Looks like they're getting an award. They're receiving awards, I guess. Yeah. White men taking good idea from woman in room claiming it as his <laughs> own. <laughs> all right. No, this is the action. Not, not all of you are wrong. <laughs> Dave Etler receives good news. <laughs> okay, it is kind of funny right now, though, because you are wearing a bluish gray shirt. I mean... You are? <laughs> Sorry. Well, this AI is good. This AI but, nailed you. It's also... it's. I mean, it's got the facial hair, like yeah, you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Some of them are... One or two of them are wearing glasses, like you. Yeah. They have white-ish <laughs> hair, like you. I, I mean, know these other days. And they're all yeah. a little bit chubby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, I don't see I you don't, don't see, see that. I don't see weight. <laughs> don't I'm weight blind. <laughs> all right, next. Oh, Santa, Santa Claus. Santa Claus Santa goes Claus to Claus the doctor. Patient, so we have yeah. a grid of Santa Claus basically. There's Santa Claus in every frame. Christmas uh, I mean, it's probably not great for your back to deliver presents to the whole earth in mm-hmm. one night. Mm-hmm. So you have to go see a doctor. Okay. Santa, Santa Claus delivering you your medical degree for Christmas. Oh, Ooh. I would say that's not bad. Oh. It is Santa Claus giving a <gasps> wow. medical student an A plus on her wow. exam. That's impressive. You're I d- as I, good as AI, Hannah. I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and I did use her. Thank you. Yeah, and, there's lots of And there's hers. women. So it's funny because it's probably some of, the only reason why. <laughs> it's funny because in some of them, the medical students are also wearing Santa Claus hats. Yeah. So, but in some of them, they're not. They're so I think that's interesting. Clearly. Enjoying the holidays. All right. Lung bags. Lung briefcase. Is it, is it a yeah? We've got a grid of medical people that carrying a bag. lung transplant. What well, lung? Carrying trauma. bags that look a Transport? lot like they have stickers of lungs on them or something. Yeah. <laughs> this looks like something that you pulled off like AliExpress.com. <laughs> 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 like the product, the bags. Yeah, yeah. There's some very fashionable teenagers somewhere in the world that are like, I love that bag. I want that <laughs> bag. <laughs> Fashion now. I want that bag. This latest in the Har- Harajuku district. <laughs> I like ultra fashionable district in, in Tokyo. All right. Well, I'll put you out of your misery. It's a medical school student carrying a lung shaped briefcase. I don't. Uh, no, no, that one failed. I okay. mean, yeah. Mm, I- and the problem is no one knows what a briefcase... Who uses briefcases anymore? These briefcases are very large also. <laughs> They're yeah, yeah, and some yeah. of them look like an actual backpack. Yeah. Uh-huh. All right. Next one. Oh, bad news x-rays. This one is This one is more... I, this one is like something very much that you would see. So that's not fanciful. It's just, it just looks like, like a broken fracture. leg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like femoral yeah, yeah. Head pretty much. Yeah. It's an X-ray yeah, of a broken femur. femur. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think it's interesting. It it knows what an X-ray is. That's good. Mm-hmm. It, and it knows, knows what, what a femur, femur is. is. I just don't know what this is. Which one? The middle left. Also, the top left. There looks like there's two <laughs> bones, and then that weird bar. Yeah. Mm. And then also, what is? Oh, I, I think some of these are. They're not. <laughs> frontal images because I think some of them are stacked if you take the x-ray from the side from the down side, yeah. oh yeah I think that's what it is I don't know how many are my left. mom would be horrified <laughs> by my use of anatomical <laughs> she's so ashamed of you yeah also you know maybe anatomy professors uh, yeah, yeah, here <laughs> just having nightmares oh, he's, he's like, putting this on your permanent record yeah. right now <laughs> I got sagittal and I got coronal that's about all I got <laughs> So those are the two ones. Yeah, yeah I'm good. That, I'm good. I'm good. good. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Well, that's our show. Maddie, Aline, Hannah, Shirayu. Dave. Thanks for being on the show with me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you. us, Dave. It's and, fun. What, and what kind of Tania Pedis would I be if I didn't thank you, Shortcoats, <laughs> for making us a part of your week? If you're new here and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. 
Our editor this week is Zach Fleischacker. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine, Student Government, and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities Program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying, don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too.